This is the eighth installment of the Crash Course Regions Chemistry series, and this is going to be on the redox unit um, as pertains by the New York State Regions curriculum. So I'm going to go over all the things you have to know for the redox portion of the test or the questions that pertain to redox, oxidation reduction on the New York State Regions. So let's get started. Okay, well, first and foremost, you have to understand some basic understandings of electrochemistry or redox. And first of all, let's start with oxidation. Okay, oxidation is an old word that came from the idea of what oxygen used to do to things. Now, if we knew that oxygen, in the presence of some metals, okay, made them rust. Okay, case in point, if the metal I'm talking about is iron, Okay, we knew that if you had exposed iron, oxygen with the iron would make the rust or the iron oxide. Sometimes we'd call this an ore, an imperfect um, amount of uh, metal. So iron oxide could look something like this. could also look something like uh, this. Okay, these are, this is iron 2 oxide. This is iron 3 oxide for the naming principles we've done before. Now, this ore, and sometimes they'll use the word ore when we find these things in the ground, these ores, most of the time we find oxides of metals in the ground. We have a lot of bauxite, which is aluminum oxide, okay, which is um, this right here. So most countries have this aluminum oxide, this ore of aluminum. It's very, very cheap. Everyone has it. The process of purifying these metals into their pure states okay, has to do with redox. Reduction oxidation reactions purify these metals. So a lot of these metals we find in the earth, with the exception of, let's say, the gold or the um, inactive chemicals, okay, um, are usually ores or oxides, which are, we call rusts of the compounds. These have reacted with the oxygen. And what's happened here? Well, the action of the oxygen has pulled the electrons from the metals. We should know enough that metals hold on to electrons loosely, and nonmetals like oxygen are small enough with a high electronegativity absorb them. So clearly, if I've got iron and I've got oxygen, okay, what's going to happen is the oxygen is going to yank the electrons away from the iron. It's going to make the iron oxidize. The process of the oxygen makes the iron oxidize. Okay, so that's where the oxidation came from. And the iron becomes charged. Let's say it's plus two. The oxygen, or one of the oxygens, let's say, of the two, absorbs those two electrons and becomes negative two. And what you make is that iron two oxide, as I just mentioned. And that's a form of ore, iron two oxide. Sorry, Roman numeral two just to note that the iron is plus two oxide because it's binary. Okay, and that is one reaction. And of course, I don't have it balanced. Okay, so let's balance that two here and a two here. And that would be a redox reaction because oxidation was occurring by the use of the oxygen. The oxygen was strong enough. Now, however, we figured out long ago that this uh, ability to draw the electrons away from the metal, okay, makes this object oxidize, and we call this the oxidizing agent. We don't really use that that much anymore. But the oxygen force the iron to undergo this oxidation, which is the loss of electrons. Okay, so we use this uh, mnemonic, Leo the lion says Ger, losing electrons is oxidation. So iron lost electrons. And what did it become? Well, it became iron oxide in this example I gave you, which is really plus two. And we're going to separate that now. So iron becomes iron plus two by losing two electrons. So oxidation, okay, is the loss of electrons. And we have that mnemonic, Leo, the lion says Ger. Now the Ger part is gaining electrons. Now who gained electrons in my simple example? Well, the oxygen. 
one of these oxygens, which we're going to find out are electrically neutral, became O negative 2. And how that happened? By gaining two electrons. Notice we call this reduction. Now it's very strange for some people when you think about reduction because how can I gain electrons and be called reduction? Well, this idea of reduction comes from the charge being reduced. We're starting with an element, and we should know elements, or this word that I've been talking about in my reviews, atom. Atom always means neutral. Why is it neutral? Because the protons equal the electrons if it's an atom. So it's always electrically neutral. Any standalone atom is electrically neutral. Now, if you're starting at a zero or the charge of an atom, neutral, and you gain two electrons, your charge, or we say the oxidation number, goes down. That the number of oxidation, it all started with what uh, oxygen did to other compounds. So the reduction means that your charge went down. Essentially, we're going from zero to negative two. And how did our charge go down? because we gained electrons. And you know why oxygen gained electrons. It's very electronegative. We've talked about this in the periodic table and the bonding unit. The metal started out as an atom as well in my simple reaction. And it's going from zero to plus two. It lost electrons and became positive. We know metals do that. We've talked about this in other crash courses. So this is kind of like a little bit of review. Redox is nothing more than a review of a little bit of atomic structure, absolutely, and ionic bonding, because we're talking about ions here. So look at this, Leo, oxidation, the number increases. Reduction, your oxidation number decreases. It's all about the electrons being passed around. So redox reactions are nothing more of the idea that we have redox means you have reduction and the ox part means oxidation and my friends in chemistry it's about the passing of electrons the one who oxidizes gives the one who reduces electrons oxidation is loss Leo the lion reduction is gain gaining electrons. So electrons will always flow from the one who loses to the one who gains. It doesn't make any sense otherwise. Okay? And all of these properties and things I'm talking about will come up in other parts of this uh, unit that I'm going to review in, in its entirety. So those are the basics. We have someone losing and you've got it. Metals tend to oxidize because they like to lose electrons. And you got it, nonmetals, which are smaller, and they attract their electrons like OCD, like their mind, gain electrons, hold on to them tightly. They tend to reduce. Now, it's reduction by gaining because their charge goes down. Metals' charges go up as they lose negatives. So it's about the, elect uh, the electrons being passed around. And believe it or not, a region's question pops up. You know, can you have reduction without oxidation? And of course you can't. You can't have someone losing unless someone's gaining in this case. So electrons are being passed around. Okay, very important. That's, that's essentially the basics we have. Now, before we go further, now that we have some basics and understanding what's reduction and oxidation, we have to put this to practice and identify reactions that are, okay, uh, redox reactions. So how do we identify a redox reaction, a reaction where electrons are being passed around? Well, there are many ways to do this, okay, but the first way is to notice, okay, that the oxidation numbers are changing. Okay, now what do I mean, what do I mean by that is if the oxidation numbers are changing, that means electrons are being passed around. Let's go back to this example right here. Okay, in fact, I want to rewrite it since it's a big mess that I've made. So I have the iron, two irons, plus the O2, making that one form of iron ore, or iron oxide, rust. Okay, and how do I identify this as a redox reaction? Well, the one way to notice is that 
the numbers will change. Now what numbers? The individual numbers. Now we're starting with an element. We should know that elements always are electrically neutral. This one is also electrically neutral. And if it's bonded, if atoms are bonded to something, they're going to have oxidation numbers other than zero. We know oxygen is negative two oxidation state, so this iron has to be plus two because all compounds are going to be electrically neutral. So what we do is we assign oxidation states. So the first thing to understand is you're going to assign oxidation states or oxidation numbers. They're easy if they're atoms in their elemental state, whether they're bonded to themselves or just hanging out. They are zero. The protons equal the electrons. But if they're bonded to something, they have something other than zero. So to identify a redox reaction, and this works about 98% of the time, okay, all you have to do is find one atom or one element hanging out in the reaction and you know it's a redox reaction. And why does this work? Because if you can find one zero, one neutral atom, go find that zero, you know that it's something other than zero on the other side, which means the oxidation numbers are changing. And why are they changing? They change because electrons are either being lost in oxidation or gained in reduction. Let's go to table I. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So when they ever ask you for a what type of reaction is this on a part two, a lot of times, and of course there are some exceptions, it's a redox reaction. Let's go to table I. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So table I lists a bunch of reactions with their enthalpies, their delta H's, their heat of reactions, exo or endo, but I'm not really worried about that. I'm trying to look at these reactions. These are combustion reactions, these first six here okay or in this case for seven and combustion reactions are denoted by this oxygen with this organic fuel giving me co2 and water and very exothermic so you can call this combustion and this is the type of organic reaction you're responsible for but if we look closely can you find me a zero and what i mean by that is can you find me an element and there it is oxygen whether it's bonded to itself or not is electrically neutral. Protons equal electrons. That's a redox reaction. Once you find just one, you know you've a redox. This is combustion, but it's also a redox reaction. Why? It's a zero here. When it's bonded to something, it's something other than zero, which you'll find out to be negative two. Its charges are changing. So all of these are redox reactions. So combustion is an example of a redox reaction. Now these reactions you learn are synthesis reactions or formation reactions, but aren't they also redox reactions? Can you find me an element? Of course you can. These are all elemental forms. Protons equal the electrons. So if you find one zero anywhere in the reaction, it's a redox reaction. Now how does, why does it work? It works because if it's a zero here, it's something other than zero in here. The oxidation numbers are changing. Electrons are being lost. That's oxidation. Electrons are being absorbed or um, taken in. That's reduction because your charge is dropping. So that's how you identify them. So you can see that most of these reactions, you can name them redox. So if you had to name something and you forget it and you see a zero or a standalone element, you know it's a redox reaction. Now, not all reactions are redox. These are ionic reactions. Okay, now, why aren't these redox reactions? Well, if you look carefully in potassium nitrate, okay, we know from table E, a nitrate ion collectively, this polyatomic ion, is negative one. And we know that K likes to become plus one. And, well, K is plus one here, and this whole nitrate's negative one. The charges are not changing. So this is not a redox reaction. So these ionic re uh, reactions, or all of these ionization reactions, although they are ionic reactions, they are all non-redox reactions because the charges are not changing. All you have is a positive attracting a negative, and they're separating. Also, double replacement reactions are also not redox reactions. Case in point, if I got lead nitrate and potassium iodide, which is the um, that yellow precipitate we make from two clear solutions, that demonstration you did or your teacher probably did, we know that lead 
has to be plus 2 in this case because each nitrate's negative 1. We know potassium is plus 1. It's a group 1 ion, and halogens are negative 1. So when you split the positives and negatives and do a double replacement, all you're going to do is switch partners. So this lead plus 2 goes with the iodide, or iodine, and Pb is still plus 2. Iodine is still negative 1. That's why you need two of these. And when you switch partners, you realize that, hey, K is still plus 1. Nitrate is still negative 1, so you need a 1 to 1 ratio. And you didn't change any charges. So double replacement reactions are not redox reactions. Okay, because their charges do not change. Now, you should know that a neutralization reaction is really a double replacement reaction. For instance, 5-hydrochloric acid plus, that's, a, that's an acid. Here's our base. It's a neutralization reaction. It breaks apart into the salt and the water. Okay, you should realize that this is really a double replacement reaction. Here's a negative. I'm sorry, here's the positive H. Here's a negative 1. For the chlorine, the positive one for the sodium, negative one for the hydroxide, and guess what? This positive one hooked up with this negative one, and they still retaining their charges, and this positive hooks up with this negative. Nobody lost their charges. So these are not redox reactions, but they're easy to identify. Do you see any standalone elements? No, you don't. Here's a classic redox reaction called a single replacement. What if I had... Um, uh, tin and copper chloride. Okay, what's going to happen is the tin is going to replace the copper and make tin chloride plus the free copper. This is a single replacement. Is this a redox? And you would say, yes, you see a standalone element. If it's by itself, it's zero. When it's bonded to something, it's other than zero. So that's very important you recognize. Now, however, we need to be able to write the oxidation numbers for these elements to know how much electrons are lost or gained. So one of the important skills of redox is assigning oxidation numbers, and let's go work on that right now. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is understand that this compound is going to be electrically neutral. So the bottom number is zero. Now, what I'm going to do is find the individual charges and hopefully they all equal up their individual ions collectively from everybody equals zero. So I must be able to assign oxidation numbers for many different questions that pop up. Not a difficult skill, but the first thing is to understand that the whole thing has to be zero unless it's a polyatomic ion itself, and I'll go over that example. So first and foremost, I got tin chloride. I got a metal and a nonmetal. So let's go look at the tin and the chlorine. So what I'm trying to do is try to find the oxidation state of tin. If you notice in the upper right hand corner, they tell you the charges the atoms love to become. So my problem here is tin has two choices. So I say, oh my gosh, so I can't start with the tin, right? The whole idea behind this is I need to know what the charges of the tin are in the compound so I can figure out in my reaction who exactly is gaining electron and who is losing. Besides the fact we're trying to identify which compounds or which uh, reactions are redox or not, we're going to eventually want to know who exactly got reduced, who exactly got oxidized. We do that by figuring out what the charges have become or what are they moving to. So we have to be able to figure out the charges. But tin's got two choices. So that's tough. You can't start there. So we go to the chlorine, the nonmetal. You may say, Mr. Grodsky, whoa, we got another problem. Chlorine's got a bunch of different choices. However, if it's a metal and a nonmetal, right, it's tin chloride. This is the nonmetal side. It's got to be what charge? If tin is positive and only can be positive as metals can only be, this has to be negative. So even though it's got multiple choices, it's only got one negative choice. So chlorine is negative one. That's our starting point. So chlorine is negative one. Individually. So I do the individual up top. Okay, the bottom is the overall. Now there's two of them. Two times negative one is negative two overall. What must be the positive charge overall? Yeah, it needs to be zero, so plus two. And since there's only one tin, it's plus two individually. So this is tin Roman numeral two chloride. Okay? Now, and that's how we do it. Now, if I have a standalone element, like I2, we should know that's, of course, zero. Or any element hanging out by itself is zero. All right? Let's go over a ternary compound. 
Like for instance, what if I had um, uh, a potassium, K, uh, uh, potassium permanganate, K, uh, KMnO4. All right. So let's not make this element small. The manganese should be the same capital letter. Okay. So potassium permanganate. Okay. Bottom numbers have to equal zero, and now I have three capitals, three elements, and here's my same problem. Where do I start? If I start with the MN, I have a problem. Houston, I have a problem. It has too many choices, so I can't start with this manganese. Okay, I have to start with the ones that only have one choice. So we look at oxygen, and we should know oxygen, although it has multiple, it has other choices, 99% of the time it's negative two. And so oxygen is going to be negative two. It has to be a definite. If we have three atoms and one has multiples, the other two have to have only one choice to figure this out. Pure logic. And potassium, a group one ion, only has one choice. Oh, so potassium permanganate, we know it's negative two for the oxygen if it's bonded. Now it's zero if it's by itself. Don't forget that. If it's by itself an element, protons equal electrons, it's an atom, it's neutral. But when bonded, these things have charges. Now, the individual charge of the oxygen is negative 2, but the overall charge due to all the oxygens is negative 8. And I went 4 times negative 2 there. Potassium is plus 1. And guess what? There's only one of them, so it's plus 1 overall. And manganese, how do we figure this out? Well, a plus 1 plus a negative 8, okay, is a negative 7. And what plus a negative 7 is 0? A plus 7. And since there's only one manganese, it's plus 7 individually. And that's how we do it. Now let's do a polyatomic ion. The choices I just gave you were all compounds that, of course, are always electrically neutral. But a polyatomic ion has a charge. So instead of these guys equaling 0, this thing is going to equal the charge of the polyatomic ion. In this case, negative 2. Don't let this charge fool you for any of the individual charges. This is the charge of the overall cluster of nonmetals listed in table E. So let's do this. So I have the whole thing is negative 2. I'm starting with my oxygen. You guessed it. Oxygen is my negative 2. If you do this enough, these are the ones you're going to remember. There's the individual charge on top, but there's seven of them. So 7 times 2 is a negative 14. All right, cool. But guess what? I need to have what? A positive 12 overall for this to be negative 2, right? Positive 12, negative 14. That's how that works. Okay? But the answer isn't positive 12 because this positive 12 is an overall for all the chromiums. But there's two of them. So the individual charge is plus 6. And that is my answer. If I said to you in a region's question, what is the charge of chromium in the dichromate ion? Okay, you're looking for that number. These overall charges help us get the individuals, just like the ones we have did here. The answers are not here. They're the individual charges. So if chromium metal went to chromium plus 6, how did that happen? Its number went up because it lost negatives and got oxidized. So that's why we do this. We want to figure out. How many electrons? Like actually, that would not be one electron. That'd be six electrons. We'll talk about that. All right. So that's how you do that. Now there are some exceptions to this rule. Okay, real quick. If I have a peroxide, if I have H2O2, you may say, "Oh, Mr. Grodsky, all well, oxygen is negative two, negative four overall. This thing has to equal zero. So my Chris, so this has to be plus four overall. Each hydrogen is plus two. Well, guess what? Hydrogen can't become plus 2. If you look on the pyrrhic table, it, it doesn't. It comes plus 1 or negative 1. And the reasoning is hydrogen can't lose 2 electrons because if you notice, hydrogen is 1 proton and 1 electron. It can't lose 2 electrons if it only has 1. So that can't work. So you may say, well, gosh darn it, the H must be positive 1, okay? And there's two of them, plus 2 overall. This has to be negative 2 overall to equal 0, which means each oxygen is negative 1. And you figured that out. In a peroxide with an extra oxygen, oxygen is negative 1. There's another weird one for oxygen. They don't post these because these are the weird, very small cases this happens. But look at this weird compound, OF2. Now, fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen. It's the most electronegative atom. So it's going to be the negative 1. 
negative 2 overall. And kind of strange, this has to be plus 2 for this to be 0. And there's the weird case of oxygen being plus 2. So oxygen, 99% of the time, is negative 2. For the weird case, it's negative 1. All right, and there's some other exceptions that pop up. But you can figure them out always by just using common sense of what has to work. Okay, moving forward. So now we're going to review the important skill of assigning oxidation numbers. Okay, and this is an important skill because in this skill, we are able to actually identify who gets oxidized and who gets reduced. A lot of regions questions will ask for, hey, which of the following half reactions represents the oxidation half reaction? So this is an important skill. Plus, part two loves to have these. So the first step is to decide whether or not this is a redox reaction to begin with. And if you haven't figured anything out, you just found me a zero, we have a redox reaction. If you find one element, one standalone element, whether it bonds to itself or not, you have your redox reaction, which means it's a zero here, it's not a zero here, which means oxidation numbers are changing. Okay, well, let's get back to it. So here's my two zeros. Chlorine we know is negative one individually, negative two overall. Copper must be plus two overall for this to be zero. There's only one copper, so plus two. I don't care about the bottom numbers anymore, it's the individual numbers. Uh, uh, chlorine only has one negative choice, so it's got to be negative one. Negative three overall, aluminum has to be plus three overall for this to be zero, but aluminum only has one choice, it only becomes plus three, but we're just using the same skill we learned. And there's our oxidation numbers. Now, they're going to ask you who gets oxidized and who gets reduced, and I want you to always remember, the answers to all of your redox reaction questions are always 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 on this side never pick any ions as products we care who gave electrons and who accepted that's all we care about these are one-way reactions do not ever ever pick anything on the product side okay all right my weird moment is over okay now let's write the half reactions so now that we have assigned oxidation numbers which is the first skill here let's pull out what changes I'm gonna take aluminum which is already on the reactant side, and I want it to become aluminum plus three. I'm going to separate out the spectator ion, okay? Aluminum plus three. And I'm also going to pull out my copper, which is on the reactant side. My, now, can't say copper, it's copper plus two, bad Grodsky. Got to be specific here, because if I say copper, I'm implying copper zero. Copper plus two is what I want. Copper plus two is what I must say. And copper plus two becomes copper zero. So all I did was take out what changed. Notice something, party people. Chlorine neither got oxidized nor reduced. Why? Because its oxidation number did not change. They may ask you in a question, hey, chlorine is doing what in this reaction? It's, and it, is it getting oxidized? Is it getting reduced? Well, it's neither oxidized nor reduced because its oxidation number is not changing. It didn't lose any electrons. It didn't gain any. Okay, so it's important to pull out what changes and identify what's not. Now, next step in this process is to figure out how many electrons were passed around and what side. My half reactions aren't complete yet. So how do I go from a zero to plus three? That was three electrons that were involved in this process. So if you're weak with this skill, remember each electron is negative one. So if you know it's three, zero to three is a difference of three. If you put the three electrons on this side, and you're not really sure, your check here is that both sides of a half reaction have to have the same charge. So a zero plus a negative three would give me a negative three on this side, this side's plus three. Uh-uh, not gonna work. And you can look at your multiple choice questions that way as well. If they're giving you half reactions, there must always be conservation of mass and charge. So we put the three electrons right here. How do I know? A negative three and a plus three is zero, this side is zero. Both sides of a half reaction have the same charge and conservation of charge. Besides, what do metals do? Metals give off electrons, so electrons should be on the product side. Now, what happened over here? Copper gained electrons. How many? From plus two to zero. It went from, it went from a high number to a low number, so it gained two electrons. And if you've got electrons on the product side on one side, you better have electrons on the reactant side because someone is producing them, someone absorbing them. You've got to get this in your beautiful heads that electrons, just like heat, if on the product side, are like exothermic. You're exiting with the heat. You're producing the heat, okay, or you're producing the electrons. Metals produce free electrons because they hold on to them loosely. 
and these, this copper plus two was absorbing like an endothermic reaction these electrons and their charge went down. Now it's understanding, you better understand that this is oxidation and this is reduction. Now who specifically got oxidized? Well, the one who got oxidized is the aluminum, aluminum zero. Don't see aluminum plus three, do not pick any choices on this side when we ask who gets oxidized or who gets reduced. It's not what you say. Who got reduced? The copper plus two. Don't say copper, copper plus two. And it's very important. This guy gained electrons, this one lost. If you want to write it this way, it's kind of like acid and bases in the sense that we're passing around, instead of protons, we're passing around electrons. This gave electrons to the copper plus two. And the copper plus two became zero charged, and it wasn't attracted to the negative one anymore, and became free. And aluminum lost three electrons, became charged, and attracted to the negative. It makes sense, okay? So that's what you have to be able to do. Now, one thing in writing half reactions, although in the regions they basically want you to do one half reaction or the other, but one thing your teacher might have had you done, had, have you done, is balance these electrons. So let's say you want to balance this reaction. And what they do sometimes, my friends, is they take away the net ions when you balance. Let me explain. This chloride ion is doing nothing, okay? Even though it, it, it's, it's saying it's bonded here, if it's a solution, really it's free ions. So what you really have is you have aluminum and you have copper plus two and it's going to aluminum plus three plus copper. This is called a net ion equation. They took out those things that weren't oxidizing or reducing. And they'll ask you to balance these. And the one way to balance these is say, well, uh, is it working? Is the charge balanced? Because conservation of mass and charge also always has to occur in every reaction. So this is a plus two on this side. This is a plus three on this side. So clearly this is not balanced. Okay, so we're gonna have to figure a way to do this. Well, one way to do that is write half reactions and we've already done that. Okay, we've already written the half reactions right here. But what we haven't done yet is balanced our charge. This has three electrons, this has two electrons. What's a common factor between three and two? And you guessed it, six. All right, I don't like green, let's do magenta. So to get six electrons on this side, I mul multiply everything by two. I distribute the two. Two times three is six. And to get three electrons here, I multiply everything by three. Three times one, three times one, three times two is six. And notice we have the same number of electrons absorbed as being produced. That makes sense. We're not destroying or creating any charge or electrons. And once you balance your charge party people, you automatically balance your reaction. Two here, three here, okay, three here, and two here. Okay, so one way to balance these net ion reactions is write half reactions and balance the reaction. Now, you could have done this without half reactions, and I know some teachers are cringing, but I'm trying to get everyone to, to do as well as they can. If you see this and notice the charges in balance, watch what I do here. Okay? I have a plus two and a plus three on this side. I have to have the same charge. What's a common factor of plus three and plus two? That sounds familiar, doesn't it? We just kind of did that right up here. So a common factor of plus three and plus two is plus six. So how can I have a plus six on this side? Because I have to have my charge balance. Once my charge is balanced on both sides, my redox reaction is balanced. Okay, well, I'm gonna put a three here. Three times two is plus six, right? Now, if I have three coppers over here, I better have three coppers over here because I'm balancing charge and I have to balance my mass. Okay, how do I get plus six over here? Well, I put a two here. Two times plus three is plus six, and if I have two aluminums over here, I have to put two aluminums here. And notice I just balanced my net ion equation without using half reactions, just using charge. Essentially, you're doing the same thing, okay? And these things do pop up. Okay, so here's my balanced reaction, and the questions that will arise from here on in is now, is this reaction spontaneous? You've heard this. What does spontaneous mean? 
that it reacts by itself? Well, spontaneous means the reaction will actually occur under a set of conditions. Does this actually occur? Okay. Spontaneous means does a reaction occur? Just sitting there, letting it do its thing, does it occur? Or do you have to force it to happen? We're going to see about reactions that are forced to happen with energy. But does this reaction occur as written? And one way to evaluate whether something is spontaneous and reacts is we use something called table J. Now let me help you. Table J is from net potentials. I have below my videos here lectures on how table J was developed through net potentials. I'm not going to get into that. It's not part of this course. It's not voltages or not. However, it's a nice way to understand it. So I'm going to give you the shortcuts understanding. But if you want the more detailed explanation, please look at those lectures. I go at length to explain how table J was originally was built. Any case, so if I look at my aluminum, which I know is oxidizing, and my plus 2 is getting reduced, its charge is going down, and the aluminum's charge is going up, okay, from the half reactions, um, how do I know this actually reacts? Well, what we do, though, know, if aluminum's going to oxidize, and if copper is going to be involved in the reduction, aluminum better be better at oxidizing. It's that simple. If aluminum's going to oxidize, it better be... Um, a, a, a better oxidizer, or I should say better at oxidizing. Stay away from oxidizer, okay, than copper. Because if copper is better at oxidizing than aluminum, then it, it's going to be hard for the copper to undergo the reduction. Okay, I, I hate that explanation, but that's what I'm stuck with without net potentials. So, Aluminum, if it's going to oxidize, better be better at it. And in Table J, they list the elements that's, uh, that, uh, the metals. Let's go there. Now, Table J is something called an activity series. It shows you how more active metals are. Now, we know metals lose electrons. Losing electrons is oxidation. So this is showing how well metals are able to oxidize. So the ones that oxidize the best are on top, and the ones who oxidize the worst are on the bottom. Notice gold is on the bottom. I introduced this topic by the idea of forming rust or oxides. Well, uh, gold or aurum, okay, never rusts in the presence of oxygen, okay? So it doesn't give up its electrons very easily, so it's a poor, it's poor at oxidizing. So it doesn't make rust. The reason why gold keeps its glimmer or its luster and its shine because oxygen just can't pull electrons away because this thing doesn't. But oxygen can pull electrons away from a lot of these other compounds. So... Back to my example, I had aluminum and I have copper. Clearly, aluminum is more active, which means as a metal, it loses electrons better or oxidizes better than copper. So therefore, that reaction is going to be spontaneous because the one oxidizing is the metal oxidizing is above the metal that's not. And if the one is below it, it's getting reduced. I hate how we have to talk about this I, again. But to get a spontaneous reaction, the one who oxidizes has to be above the one who gets reduced. If I wrote the reaction the other way, and I wrote it right here, if I wrote it the opposite way, copper would need to oxidize and aluminum would have to reduce, right? This is going from plus 3 going down to 0. Copper 0 becomes positive going up. So this would have to oxidize. But in table J, copper is not above aluminum. So there, therefore, copper is not going to oxidize where aluminum gets reduced. That won't work. That would give me a non-spontaneous reaction that does not occur. And this makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If it's spontaneous in the forward direction, it's always going to mean it's non-spontaneous non in the reverse. You know, a spontaneous process is like uh, dropping an egg and watching it shatter. It's, it's spontaneous to watch it break apart to pieces. It's non-spontaneous for the pieces to come back together and reform the egg. And this has implications in thermodynamics that we just don't touch upon here in Regents Chem. But that, that's it. Okay, so you can figure out whether something reacts or not by using table J. However, there are going to be reactions that just have nonmetals. Okay? They didn't stop at making table J 
from net potentials, they even stretched it out for nonmetals as well. For instance, if I had a reaction where I had um, fluorine gas and I have the bromine liquid, and they asked you, what compound are you going to make? Well, you think with me, both of these are zero. All right. Um, to make a compound, doesn't one have to become positive? And one have to become negative? Which one becomes positive? Which one becomes negative? Well, the way that I drew it, this Br is going to be plus one. This F is going to be negative one. And if I balance this, now it's happy. If you look at me, F0 goes to F negative 1 by where the electron goes so that both sides have the same charge. It would have to go here. That's F what? Getting reduced. Then we have Br0 going to Br plus 1. And that would have to lose an electron. Lose negatives and positives. So Br would have to oxidize and F fluorine would have to reduce to make this so. How do you know this is spontaneous or not because there's no nonmetals on the metal side? Well, let's go to table J. There is a nonmetal active series. As you probably already guessed, fluorine's better at reducing. This is how reducing. Losing electrons is metal. Grr, gaining electrons is nonmetals. So this is not a, not a list of who oxidizes best. This is a list of who gets reduced the best. So on in this list, the one who oxidizes has to be above the one who reduces to be spontaneous. In this list, it's the one who reduces has to be above the one who oxidizes for this to be spontaneous. So this, so fluorine in my example was getting reduced, bromide was getting oxidized, that would be spontaneous. And that's how we would use table J to identify that this is spontaneous. Now if I wrote it the other way, where I had the uh, F positive, which means it have to oxidize, and the Br negative, FBr, this is non-spontaneous. This would mean that F would have to oxidize, and F is above Br in the non-metal side. It's better at being reduced, so this would be non-spontaneous. So we can, um, we can in fact, uh, figure out if a reaction will work or not by the word spontaneous by using table J. Just be careful that on the metal side, it's oxidation over reduction that works, and on the non-metal side, it's reduction over oxidation. A terrible table. They should be using net potentials, but that's my two cents. Okay, moving forward. So now we're left with basically the two applications of electrochemistry, which are the voltaic cell or the galvanic cell, and I have more in-depth, de detailed uh, lectures on this as well as the electrolytic cell. So let's get started with the basics. A voltaic cell is spontaneous. Very important you understand that. It's spontaneous cell. Why is it spontaneous? Because it works. It produces energy. We don't have, we don't need a battery to run a battery to run a battery to run a battery. Batteries produce energy because they're set up in a way that the one who oxidizes gladly does so to the one who reduces. You don't set up a battery the wrong way from table J. It won't work. So, the first step in a voltaic cell is identifying who the anode is. And some things you have to understand, this thing called anox red cat. Okay, anox red cat is another little uh, mnemonic we use. So the anode is the place of oxidation. So I've got two electrodes. The electrodes are the place where the, elect where the redox actually occurs. So who is the anode? The anode is the place of oxidation. I have two le metal electrodes, magnesium and, ca uh, and copper. Who is better at oxidizing? Table J, here we go. Magnesium is clearly higher than copper. So magnesium likes to oxidize better. So therefore, it is the anode. It's the absolutely the first thing you do when you look at a voltaic cell. So the magnesium is the anode. It's the place of oxidation. That means the copper is the cathode, the place of reduction. Anox, anode oxidation, red I said red ox? Wow, Bedgrodsky, red cat. Okay, anox red cat is the mnemonic. Sorry for those that knew that and were screaming at me. Couldn't hear you. So the cathode is a place of reduction. Now, what happens at the anode? Oxidation. Well, what'd you learn? Leo the lion says Gur. Losing electrons. So the magnesium zero, which is the metal, 
becomes mg plus 2 plus two electrons that are kicked out. So a piece of this magnesium becomes mg plus 2. So magnesium's corroding, disappearing, getting smaller. The solid metal is becoming the aqueous ion. And electrons are being pushed along the conducting wire to the copper. Now, at the cathode, red cat, okay, what we have is the copper plus two move toward the electrode where reduction occurs, and the copper plus two in solution gains the two electrons that were given by the magnesium to produce pure copper. Look at that, negative two plus two, zero. And you need to understand, anytime a metal is zero, it's solid. So a solid metal is going to an aqueous ion, and an aqueous ion is, ion is making a solid. We're plating here. This one's getting bigger. We're adding copper to this. Okay? Now, how are electrons flowing? Electrons are flowing always from the anode metal to the cathode. Why? Why? Because it makes sense. The one who gives up electrons has to go to the place that is going to accept them. So always anode to the cathode flow of electrons, but not through the solution, through the metal electrode, through the wire, to the metal. Okay? Now, we're missing a component here, because this battery does not work at all unless we have this salt bridge. And this salt bridge is how you identify this as a battery. Every battery needs one. Now, let's put sodium chloride in here which means I have chloride ions and sodium ions in solution. What a salt bridge does is allow the ions to flow to keep these beakers electrically neutral. Why? Well, as magnesium increases, right, as we increase magnesium plus two ions, I should say, this beaker starts to get positive. How can electrons go away to the cathode if this is positive? Negatives are attracted to positives. So what happens is the negative ion in the salt bridge comes down and it kind of neutralizes this positive or counteracts the positives here so that this beaker doesn't get positive. On this side we're losing positive charges so this beaker is getting negative as copper plus two becomes copper zero. So the positive ion moves down to replace that. You know. Also this positive ion here as I've taught you in more detail is free to migrate also to replace the positive. So it allows the ions to flow to keep these beakers electrically neutral so electrons can flow. Now, just so happens that we give the anode just by convention the negative sign in the battery. Is it really negative? Is there really something in the negative charge? No, we just call it the negative charge for us to understand to place where electrons are coming from. And we give the cathode the positive charge, because electrons are traveling to it. Do not think electrons go from negative to positive. Do not do that. These are just charges that we give the cell to make some sense of all of this. Okay, and essentially that's it. Now, with every voltaic cell they give you, or galvanic cell, because it was Luigi Galvani and as Alessandro Volta that were responsible for the first work of batteries, they always give you an overall reaction. So if you couldn't figure out a lot of what I just did here, they give you the clue. Who's oxidizing? This side. Only pick from this side. Metals can only oxidize. So when you see half reactions like this, or overall redox reactions, pick the standalone metal. Look who's getting reduced. Copper plus two. Because they could ask you, who's getting reduced in this reaction? And so many people will say, oh, the cathode is the copper. That's getting reduced. No, no, no. The cathode itself doesn't undergo reduction. It's the place of reduction. It just so happens that the anode actually undergoes oxidation, but the cathode is a place where it occurs. It's the copper plus two that is getting reduced specifically, and you can see that very clearly because where is the hint? Answers to these questions are always on the reactant side. He's getting oxidized. He's a metal. Standalone can only get oxidized. Metals lose electrons. Now, Metal ions can gain electrons to reform the solid. So that's all the basic principles of a voltaic cell. You have to know it's spontaneous, 
You have to know it's exothermic. It, it, it creates electrical energy from chemicals. Okay, it gives off energy. The other one that's different, of course, is the electrolytic cell. Let's go to that one. Okay. The electrolytic cell is different from the voltaic cell. In the word electrolytic, you'll see electricity. This needs a battery. Voltaic cells are a battery. So this is a non-spontaneous process. Without the battery, this won't occur. Now, what I'm trying to get done here is electroplating. It's an example of one of the electrolytic cells. Electrolytic cells. Okay, so I'm trying to get the silver to jump on this fork. This is my ugly chicken fork. Everyone has one, of course. So I want to silver plate this fork. I could care less what metal this is. It's a cheap metal. As long as it's a conducting uh, a metal, it's fine. So I want the silver to jump on this, and if I was to cut these wires, it's never going to happen because silver is not going to get out of... See, what I need silver to do is I, I need silver zero to become silver plus one and give off an electron. So I want a piece of silver become silver plus one. And silver resists oxidation. If you look at table J, it's way below okay, the column there, so it doesn't like to oxidize. So it, it, it just refuses to oxidize for the most part, but the battery will force it to happen. The battery will pull charge back to it and force this to oxidize. So this oxidizes, and you, as before, anox red cat, this must be the anode, right? And I want this silver plus two to gain electrons on the fork, and I want the silver plus to gain an electron to reform silver zero. And as I talked about before, here we have the solid metal becoming the aqueous ion, and here we have the aqueous ion becoming solid. I want, this, I want it to solidify and plate. And plating always occurs at the cathode because this is reduction. Red cat. Okay, reduction occurs the cathode. Again, none of this occurs unless the battery forces it to happen. So electrolytic cells are endothermic. They need energy to make them happen. Okay, they're taking electrical energy and making it into a chemical energy. The battery, the voltaic, takes chemicals and makes electrical. It's a big difference. But now, let's think about what's happening here. Flow of electrons always have to, have to go from the one who gives up electrons. So electrons have to flow from the anode of the battery to the cathode. Has to be. Where do these electrons come from? They came from the anode which, by the way, the battery is negative. And they get pumped back to the cathode of the battery. Why? Because this is the anode. Electrons always flow from anode to cathode. And this is a positive in the battery. Now, so everything really is very similar. Cathode has reduction, gaining electrons, grr. The anode has oxidation. That's very similar. Electrons flow from anode to cathode. That's the same. What's different? Well, you need a battery. It's not spontaneous. It requires energy. Okay, and the final thing that's different is the charge of the cathode is different from the electrolytic cell. Okay, and the charge of the cathode is negative. And the reason is it's attached to the negative part of the battery. If you were to clip this, this would have no charge. So the anode, which is negative, makes this negative. And the cathode is positive, makes this positive. So that's one thing that is different, the charges are flipped. And I remember my anode is negative for the battery, cathode is positive, and I know that because electrons flow back to the battery to close that circuit. And by the way, there's no salt bridge here. Why? Not needed. Okay, we're trying to force something to happen. Okay, uh, a battery needs one. And that's essentially what's happening. So there's very similar, there's a lot of similarities here. Anode to cathode, electron flow the same. Um, oxidation still occurs the anode. Reduction stirs the cathode, except that we're being, it's being forced to happen. Okay, let's look at electrolysis of fused salt now. Okay, so this is a second application of electrolysis. Again, we need a battery to force it to happen. What I'm taking is potassium chloride, which is an ionic compound, doesn't cut electricity. I'm going to apply a lot of heat, and I make the liquid form of KCl. When it's liquid, 
it's an electrolyte. The ions are now free. So molten KCl means I have this liquefied uh, gel of hot ions that are free to move. Now the battery is negative here. It's the anode of the battery is here. The cathode of the battery positive is here. And as we've learned, this negative makes this negative. This positive makes this positive. Electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. So this is the cathode, which is negative, an electrolytic cell. And this is the anode, which is positive because this is positive. How do I know it's the anode? Electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. Now, battery pumps out electrons. The positively charged ion is attracted to it. And K plus gains an electron. Okay, gets reduced. Red cat. Okay, and becomes K0. We're purifying a metal here. It plates on the cathode. Over here, the Cl negative is attracted to the positive. Now, the reason why it's positive, it's losing charge to the cathode of the battery. So the Cl at the anode, anox, gets oxidizes, loses an electron, okay, and becomes pure chlorine. Now, in truth, this is diatomic, so two of these, two electrons, Cl2, and here we make pure chlorine gas. So electrolysis of a few salt, okay, makes the pure compound. But again, this doesn't occur unless you add a battery. And this is how we purify a lot of metals that are ores, okay? Pure potassium is explosive. So to have it, we're going to have to purify it from when it's in its what? Stable state. Group 1, group 2 ions are never found in nature uncombined. So we have to uncombine them through this process. Okay, so another example of electrolysis. So that's basically the redox unit. Okay, one thing that does pop up is sometimes a little bit of stoichiometry. For instance, uh, if you go back to um, one of our drawings over here, let's go back to way over here, magnesium. So magnesium zero is going to magnesium plus two, plus two electrons. Both sides have the same charge. And here's what they could say. They could say, hey, if I've got um, 10 moles of electrons, okay, how much magnesium's metal, okay, will be, uh, uh, how much Mg plus two will be produced? So you know that there's a one to two ratio here, right? For every one magnesium, two electrons are given off. So if I've got 10 moles, then five, 10 moles of electrons, then five magnesiums will be corroded into the Mg plus two. So anytime you see moles and electrons, just look at their ratio. It's very simple, okay? So if they say to me in a question, well, how many moles of magnesiums will corrode to Mg plus two? Corrosion is a solid becoming an ion here. And you would say, well, because it's a one, I need two, elect two electrons are given up for this, 10 electrons must be produced, okay, to get rid of what? Five of these, right? For every one, there's two, so five moles of magnesium would produce 10 moles of electrons. Very, very straightforward. Okay, and there's one more point I want to make, okay, that I didn't touch on before, and that's the production of hydrogen gas. If I've got zinc plus hydrochloric acid, okay, and we did this in their lab, we'll make zinc chloride and hydrogen gas. This is a redox reaction because I see my zeros. This is plus one, negative one, plus two, negative one. And what's happening is the zinc is oxidizing, as all standalone elements do, to become zinc plus two, plus two electrons. And the two H pluses, and I'm putting two there because I'm making H2, and two electrons will make my H2 to gas. The question I'm going to pose to you is that you should know which elements will react with hydrochloric acid to make the free H2O. So this is a table G question. Let's go table J. So as you can see, this H2 is the standard cell that I talk about in my other lectures, but it's really two H pluses getting reduced, okay? So when I say H2 here, they're really talking about the H pluses. And if H plus is going to get reduced, the hydrogen is going to get reduced, as we talked about, the ones who oxidize have to be above it. So if you notice, zinc is way above 
the H2, so it will produce hydrogen gas. It will reduce the H plus twos. Chromium will, iron will, cobalt. So and all these metals above the H pluses or the H2 will force H plus to get reduced, right? The one who oxidizes is above the one who reduces. However, if you put hydrochloric acid, that's where the H pluses come from, with copper, silver, or gold, these will not produce H2 because these are port oxidizing. Okay, so that's what does, does come up. You should know which metals with an H plus produce the higher hydrogen gas. And that's essentially the unit as a whole. If you need more focus on some of these parts, please look at my other videos that go in more detail of these other specifics. Hope you enjoyed that.